welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from Scotland. The Scottish constitutional debate is highly charged, provoking many and varied commentators and participants. None more so than our guest of today. Professor Richard Murphy started his career as a chartered accountant. However, much of his analysis these days is on economics and political economy. Whether he's attacking UK chancellors for the timidity of the economic response to crisis or intervening in Scottish political debate, he is one of the most clear-sighted and articulate of commentators, providing an alternative viewpoint to conventional wisdom. Much more from Professor Murphy later on in the show, but first to your tweets, messages and emails in response to our show last week on COVID-19 and whether it will be ever with us. Of course, we heard from the wonderful so Professor Hugh Montgomery. We've had lots and lots of comments. First of all, from Lindy, who says, excellent interview with Professor Montgomery. Embedding equality, addressing poverty and dealing with public health properly should form the basis for Scotland's route map out of COVID. Andrew says, Professor Montgomery, absolutely superb on the show. Speaks so well and communicates complex science and issues so clearly and effectively. And as he's on the front line of intensive care, he should command the highest respect from all of us. And we need to listen to his key messages. Thank you. Ira says, brilliant programme, Alex. Instinct says that COVID was in Scotland at the latter end of 2019. Maybe that's a question that could be explored. Fiona says, really interesting show. Good to actually hear what the interviewee has to say without interruption. Thank you. We then had a discussion about long COVID and Louise says, wasn't ME chronic fatigue syndrome largely discovered by patients too? Long COVID seems closely related and ME is still largely ignored and underdiagnosed. Will research into long COVID help ME sufferers? I've heard already of ME sufferers describing their condition as possible long COVID in order to have their symptoms taken seriously. Alan says in response, my mate Jimmy is still managing to work, but it's an easy job that he doesn't really have to exert himself at it. Although he still struggles with doing his job, he ends up not eating at his tea break because he ends up falling asleep and he falls straight to sleep when he's eaten something at lunchtime. Well, this topic of long COVID is clearly of great interest to many of our viewers and I'm glad to see in the next few weeks we will be having a show dedicated specifically to that topic. But now over to Alex, who's in conversation with Professor Richard Murphy. Professor Richard Murphy, welcome back to the Alex Salmon Show. Hi, good to be with you. Richard Murphy, you've come into being a, known as a vigorous commentator on the political and economic scene, but your background is a, an accountant. Now, so how did a, an accountant get into this political debate? I mean, did you work your way through economics to the excitement of political economy, or, or is this after a, a career in accountancy you thought it was time for the walk in the wild side? I actually think the two are fundamentally related, Alex. I mean, I did an undergraduate degree as in economics, and so clearly that's where that interest started. And I was always interested in the relationship between accountancy and, if you like, the macro economy, how the rules of business shaped the way in which the economy worked and served people within it. So to me, accountancy and economics and political economy are really just different angles of the same issue. You, know, you can say that accountancy is micro and looking at the economy as a whole is macro, but actually, when we look at things like governments, they're also doing accounting and how they account makes a big difference to how we understand their affairs too. So these issues for me are just all angles on the same thing. How do we meet the needs of people? Now, you've been associated with uh, innovations like the, the Green New Deal. Uh, you've also been a trenchant critic of economic orthodoxy. I mean, do you think you're, you're making ground with some of these views and is it going to be enough to get us out of the post-pandemic slump? I have a very sorry tale to tell in some ways, which is that it seems that most of my ideas take 10 to 15 years to move from being you know, an inkling on my computer screen towards something that becomes reality. You know, I created an idea to tackle international tax abuse in 2003, which became law in 2017. The Green New Deal was written in the first instance in 2008, and here in 2021, no one has really committed to it yet. But the time will come. I do think it takes people time to acclimatize to what are really new ways of looking at the world. 
And the Green New Deal is just an example of looking at the world in a new way. And normally there's got to be a pivotal moment when things will change. With regard to my work on tax, it was the 2008 financial crisis, because suddenly every government in the world found itself short of tax revenue and desperate to find some more. And so they began to tackle tax havens. This time we have got ourselves into an almighty financial crash. There is no big idea to solve the problem anywhere within any form of capitalism around the world at present. So we've got to look at governments to solve that. That's the Green New Deal. Now, how about the new ideas and economics just now in terms of practical effect? I mean, the new monetarism, the, the new theories, uh, well, quantitative easing in itself and how that could be expanded to hit the, the real economy. Uh, are people still as thorough to balance sheet economics or, or is there more uh, openness to, to taking a different approach uh, because of the extent of the emergency that we're facing? Right now, there is a lot of new economic thinking. Some has had a real impact. Quantitative easing was just literally the creation of a professor at the University of Southampton who went to Japan and told them, you can run almost unlimited deficits in your situation and you will control inflation as a result and you will generate full employment as a result. One man, one idea, one outcome, it worked. It's been transported around the world. We now have trillions of it. Modern monetary theory takes the idea further and says that we don't need to balance the government's books. We need to balance the economy, which means we need to put people to work. Could these things be come into fruition? Yes, of course. But only if we overcome this paranoia that the economy must be run like a business, which we inherited from one person above all else, and that is Margaret Thatcher, who brought it into government from her father's shop in Grantham. So in terms of getting this uh, idea into policy effect, I mean, do we need a John Maynard Keynes? Do we need somebody to, to, to grasp the idea and ram it down the throats of the Chancellor of the Exchequer or the, the Governor of the Bank of England? I mean, how is this going to be done? How the opportunity that uh, exists when a crisis is greater than that exists in normal times? It's in a crisis that that people come forward to take risks uh, to get the job done. What's the prospects of that happening now? What we need are two things. We naturally need political leaders who will listen to the thinking that's being created. And that's what happened in the 1930s. Roosevelt was willing to take the risk on the likes of Keynes. So we need political leadership, which is willing to break out of this cycle of austerity economics. And certainly in the two leading UK parties at the moment, the largest ones, Labour and Conservative, we're not seeing that. And we, we also need a people to communicate the message. You're doing that by putting me on this program now. But what's wrong with the apparently common sense idea that look we're running up the bills and the debt like there was no tomorrow because you know, there wouldn't have been any tomorrow unless we'd been prepared to to do it but somehow the bills will come thudding through the letterbox the accounts will have to be paid what is essentially wrong with that apparently foolproof common sense idea that one day the accounts have to be paid. Well, the simple answer is that they won't have to be paid because they have been paid. And that's what most people don't get. Of course, we've paid the bills. We've seen the money go out into the economy. Businesses have been kept afloat. Furlough has been provided. The government has continued to provide the NHS. How has he done it? It's done it by creating new money. How did it create the new money? By, well, literally, I'll show you what it uses for the process. It's deeply technical. There you are. It's a keyboard, Alex. <laughs> That's my prop. And what does that do? They literally type the numbers into a keyboard and it appears. Ben Bernanke said that when he was chairman of the Fed in the USA. So it is electronic money created on a keyboard that has paid for this. The money, however, does something else. It also keeps the banking system going. If we now want to withdraw that money that the government has created, a total in the last year or so of 400 billion, but over the last decade or so, 800 billion, out of the economy, we're going to crash the banking system. Do we want to do that? I don't think so. 
if we tried to repay other parts of the national debt, we'd be forcing people like, oh, premium bond holders to give up their savings. Do we want to do that? I doubt it. If we wanted to repay guilts, so we'd be forcing foreign governments to move their money out of the UK. Do we want them to do that? I don't think so. What would we? What also would we have to do? Force pension funds to give up saving in government guilts. Why would we want to do that? I don't know, because it's the safest, most secure means for saving for a pension that there is. In other words, either people have what saved with the government to pay the bills because they really want the security the government supplies, or the government has created the money to pay the bills with its own ability to borrow from the Bank of England, none of which has to be repaid, but which, if it was, would crash the banking system. We are where we are, and where we are is actually quite a comfortable place with regard to debt. People want to own it, and nobody wants to take it out of circulation. Let's accept the fact that this is stability as we now find it. And would it be a reasonable thing to say that the, the real constraints uh, that... Uh, 11 Downing Street should be focusing on uh, are not when the bills come in. It's on the one hand the utilisation of productive potential. Are, are people going to be employed? Are they going to be making things? Are they going to be producing goods and services? And on the other hand, uh, inflation and keeping that under control. As long as you can do these two things, you should move the, use the maximum latitude uh, in terms of your ability to, uh, to create money uh, and indeed to ease it through the economy, hopefully in a, a socially just fashion. I couldn't agree with you more, Alex. Look, let's look at the economic reality on the ground at the moment. There are around 3 million people unemployed in the UK right now. That's significant. That's, in long-term record-keeping, a large number of unemployed people. This is real unemployed, not necessarily just the numbers on the token gesture that they keep. There's over 3 million people still on furlough. Now, that's also worrying, because put those two together and we get over 6 million people not working. That's around 20% of the UK workforce at present sitting around doing nothing. So the first job that Rishi Sunak's got to do is work out how to get those people to work in the places where they are. This doesn't require big, grand schemes like HS2. This is about creating jobs where people are. Now, that's what people in this country want, and that's what the environment demands as well. He's got to spend on that. And can he spend? Look, the answer is he can still borrow money at what are effectively negative interest rates. The amount paid by the government is less than the rate of inflation. So at the end of the term, if he had to repay the debt, and the government never does have to repay its debt because it always just rolls it over into a new debt, but if he had to, he'd pay back less than he borrowed. How many of us would take out a mortgage if we discovered at the end of the period we paid less for the house than we'd actually offered to buy for in the first place? That's the opportunity he's got, and he's not taking it. He's saying he'd rather balance the books than actually create this new opportunity for people to work in this country. It's madness not to take the chance now. Join us after the break, where Alex continues his discussions with Professor Richard Murphy and asks the key question, about Scottish independence. We'll see you then. Welcome back. Alex is in conversation with Professor Richard Murphy of City University of London. Now, Professor Murphy, you've been known for your general interventions on the economics, uh, uh, but also you've taken a keen interest in the, in the Scottish debate and the constitutional and economic debate in Scotland. Where, where does this interest uh, come from? I mean, uh, your uh, antecedents seem to be in a, a Celtic nation somewhat to the, the west of us, are they not? They are obviously in a country to the west of us. Like, I mean, I'm, my grandfather was the Irishman, but I'm married to a woman whose parents were Irish and my children qualify as Irish through her. We have Irish family. I know Ireland. I love the place. And I know as a result of that, how important it is to understand the desire to be an independent country. You know, we're now a century away from Ireland claiming its independence. And I think that that really informs a lot of what my thinking around this is. I believe that my Irishness has informed my perspective of the Scottish issue. And you call for new economics uh, in the United Kingdom. 
has a particular resonance and relevance for the, the Scottish constitutional debate at the moment. Uh, explain what that is. Income in Scotland is smaller, inevitably, than expenditure for Scotland, which includes quite a lot spent in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, potentially, for the benefit, supposedly, of Scotland. Scotland becoming the dumping ground for Westminster's budget, if you like. We know that Scotland has always balanced its books. It's had no choice but balance its books. That is the devolution that has been provided. And that is also true of every local authority in Scotland. They too have to balance their books. And yet apparently Scotland ran this enormous deficit way out of proportion to any other part of the country. And I just thought this is nonsense. The basis on which this debate is taking place is completely skewed in favor of one side of the argument and against the other. And so I intervened. I just said, this is nonsense, let's put this right, let's try and find the real figures. We still haven't got them, although there's been some progress made. Having intervened at that level, I then realised that there was an appetite in Scotland, post-2014, to still develop the thinking around how Scotland could move towards independence despite the setback that you know better than anyone of that year. And so I've been involved with organisations that are looking at that issue now. Can we build the idea of a new nation? So I wrote a white paper on how to have a tax system for Scotland. The opening assumption of which is, well, we'll have to start with what the UK's got, but we certainly don't want to end there because it really isn't good and it doesn't reflect society in Scotland. And that's, I think, what really interests me about the whole thing. No nation that I know of has ever tried to become independent because it wants to keep the structure of the society of the country that it's left. But is it possible for Scotland to be better off in the future than it is now? Yeah. Why? Look at the fundamentals. It was once oil that was claimed to be Scotland's prosperity. Now it's sustainable energy. It's the tides, it's wind. And I recently saw a tweet from the Scottish Tories that said, oh, wind and tide are running out. Really? Uh, no way is that possible. Yeah. <laughs> wind and tide are never going to run out in Scotland. That's the merit of Scotland. It's got this absolute competitive advantage over the whole of Europe with regard to sustainable energy for the future and a willing customer just to the south who's going to need it. Scotland has the basis for prosperity. And I just find this so incredibly exciting. Now, not content with intervening in the budgetary debate, you've recently been jousting with the London School of Economics on the, the trade debate. Uh, but surely there is an argument that if Brexit has caused huge problems, and it has for the UK, then independence in trade terms would cause huge problems for Scotland. I think there's a number of things that have to be drawn out of this report from the London School of Economics, where they've said that the costs of trade between Scotland and the rest of the world, but particularly England, will go up significantly if there's independence. Now, will it go up? I think that's indisputable. I mean, obviously, if you put a border in, you're bound to have a small increase in cost. But let's also be totally honest, one of the reasons why people will choose to be independent in Scotland is that I am certain an independent Scotland will want to rejoin the EU. I really cannot imagine Scotland wishing to stay out of EFTA, first of all, and the EU eventually. They don't have to join the euro, by the way, let's just put that one to the side. You have to promise to rejoin, but you don't ever have to actually fulfil your promise. It's really a bit naughty, but that's the way Sweden's done it, that's the way Scotland would do it. So, First of all, Scotland could remove the most penal trade barriers that it's already suffering by getting rid of the problems of Brexit. And then if we look at this report from the LSE, the assumptions within it, and all economists work on the basis of assumptions, are really quite absurd. They note that Scotland has six times more trade between Scotland and England than they would normally expect for two adjacent countries. Well, that's because at the moment they're one country in economic terms. Secondly, they note there's actually no data on which to base this conclusion. Nobody is measuring trade between England and Scotland now because there is no border. So they made up the data 
bluntly, they had to create the data sets. They say so in their work. And they come out with this extraordinary claim that nearly 60% of all Scottish income is imported and almost 60% of all Scottish production is exported. Well, given that the scale of the service sector is very large in Scotland as it is in England, how on earth is so much exported? That means almost every person who's in a Scottish hospital must be English, for example. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, so the data literally is nonsensical, out of all possible proportion. So then they assume that nothing will change if Scotland becomes independent. But we've only got to look at the recent experience of Ireland to realise that actually everything changes if you put borders in place. Ireland has got round the borders between it and England and Europe by simply putting in new ferry routes. Scotland, if independent, would begin to put in different transport arrangements for certain forms of transport. We could see a revival of Scottish ports, for example. Presswick will become a much more important airport than it is now. I mean, everything will change. And their estimate of costs was based upon the increase in the costs of um, transport into and out of Ireland in 1922. Um, I hate to tell you, but things have changed since 1922. I wasn't around at the time. You weren't around at the time. But they don't even take into consideration that England was trying to penalise Ireland in 1922. After all, they'd just been at war with each other, effectively. And there was only one way in and out of Ireland, which was through England. Well, via Wales. But the point is, that all the control was with England. So of course costs were put up. Scotland won't be in that position. It won't have loads of options. This report was pure and utter nonsense. Of course, it's very important that the common travel area would be undiminished, uh, regardless of whether there were uh, posts and, uh, and borders for goods and services. Uh, that's a point that I think probably escapes uh, the general public, is it not? Well, I think it's absolutely critical that it's retained. Of course, it is critical. And remember that that was retained post-1922 with Ireland. So, yeah, the freedom of movement of people should always be retained in a post-independent settlement. Absolutely fundamental. But, but thinking about Scottish independence and the European debate, given all you say, Professor Murphy, eh, the importance of having a currency, eh, minimising the impact of... Uh, transactions uh, and the border, wouldn't uh, EFTA and the European Economic Area be a rather more attractive prospect for Scotland than the European Union full scale? Because although the promise uh, to join the euro at some stage may be an empty promise, it's still a promise. Can you see the attractions in a EFTA position for Scotland? I don't dismiss EFTA as a step on the way towards full EU membership. But my belief is that full EU membership is about Scotland taking its seat at the international table to, at which it rightfully belongs. And EFTA is a bit of an outsider's organisation. It's peripheral and it takes rules fundamentally from Europe and other organisations, the WTO, and has little opportunity to shape them for itself. So the advantages are, well, better than not being an EFTA, but they aren't an opportunity to really play that international role that Scotland could Scotland is not too wee to be sitting in Brussels, flying its own flag, shouting its own message and influencing the future of Europe, as much as for the people of Scotland as for everybody else who needs to know what Scotland's got to say. And so for political reasons, I do not see why Scotland would want to stay stuck with EFTA. And I'm absolutely certain that the Euro problem is not one that is going to be imposed upon Scotland. Nobody is now being forced to join the Euro because everybody knows there are problems with it. So Scotland could sit in limbo on the Euro for, well, many years before beyond when you and I are ever going to be worried about it. And I think therefore EFTA is just a halfway house that's the sort of compromise, the sort of wishiness that Scotland doesn't need anymore. Scotland needs to be right where it's at. But the EFTA countries, uh, uh, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Norway, Iceland, all in the top 10 in the world in economics uh, wealth per head, they, they don't seem to be suffering over much from their EFTA membership, do they, Richard Murphy? 
Well, <laughs> Alex, I hear what you say, but each of them has something which is rather odd to look at. You know, Switzerland, its long-term finance sector, Liechtenstein, a tax haven, Norway, oil, etc. Scotland is not is good, but I don't think it's in that sort of economically advantaged place that many of those are, which leaves them accepting the compromise of being outside Europe. Scotland is actually dependent upon labour. Scottish people in a way that none of those states is dependent so much upon the labour of their people. So Scotland needs to be in Europe. And this is a debate to be had. I mean, one of the things that's going to be happening on the day, literally we're broadcasting this, is that I'll be taking part in a debate about this very issue and where Scotland should be going. The great thing is, and this is what's so exciting again about Scottish politics that I just don't get in English politics, is that Scotland and the people of Scotland want to talk about this. And so everything is so different in Scotland from England, where there's an air of defeatism, whereas Scotland looks as ev at everything as if it's an opportunity. There is an opportunity to discuss EFTA or the EU and EU and the Euro and everything in between. And Scotland's opportunity is to grab one of those and run with it for its own best benefit and I think that's where we're heading and that's why we're having the debate. Yes only if Scotland had the financial acumen of Switzerland, the energy potential of Norway, the, the fish and the resources and the clean environment of Iceland then of course our future would be assured. Uh, <laughs> and the universities that it's already got. Um, look, Scotland's future is assured. You know that, I know that, and what is more, I am quite convinced that in my lifetime it's going to happen. The real challenge for me is, do I move to Scotland? Which is another advert for the common travel area. <laughs> Professor Richard Murphy, thank you so much for joining me once again on the Alex Salmon Show. Thanks, Alex. Professor Richard Murphy provides a powerful voice of clarity and reason in favour of alternative strategies for economics and politics. In the famous Monty Python Lion Tamer sketch, John Cleese offered vocational advice to a chartered accountant not to move straight into the danger of lion taming, but to work his way towards it via, for example, banking. No such fears from Professor Richard Murphy, of course, who, from an accountancy background, has entered the political and economic arena in both the UK and in Scotland, and tamed more than a few lions along the way. But for now, from Alex and myself and all at the show, it's goodbye, stay safe, and we hope to see you all again next week. <laughs>